one of the things that we're going to need to do in calculus a significant number of times is solve inequalities in equations. Okay, so it says in calculus you are frequently required to solve inequalities involving variable expressions such as negative 2x minus 3 is less than 7. A number is a solution of an inequality if the inequality is true when a, when a is substituted for x. The set of all values of x that satisfy the inequality is called the solution set to the inequality. The following properties are useful for solving inequalities. Similar properties are obtained when less than is replaced by less than or equal to and greater than is replaced by greater than or equal to. So what's the properties? Look, these are the things that you already know. Um, you do have a transitive property. Well, some of these you know, some of these you might not. One of them is called a transitive property. So if we know A is less than B and B is less than C, then we know that A has to be less than C. If you want to visualize that, if you're a visual learner, here you have A has to be to the left of B and B has to be to the left of C because A is less than B and B is less than C. So naturally, when we look at that, we know that A has to be to the left of C or A has to be less than C, okay? What can we do to solve inequalities? Well, if we know A is less than B and C is less than D, then we know that A plus C is less than B plus D. So if we take the two smaller numbers and add them together, we know that that's smaller than the two bigger numbers added together. Uh, what do we know? What does that really help us with? What that means is we can add whatever we want to both sides of an inequality when we're solving it. Um, next one says multiplying by a positive constant. If A is less than B, then AC is less than BC. And then there's multiplying by a negative constant. If A is less than B, then AC is greater than BC. Here's what I want to note. This one's really important. If you multiply by a negative or divide by a negative, I'm writing this out, divide by a negative, flip the sign of the inequality. flip the inequality. So if you notice, before it was a is less than b, and then you look, we multiplied it by a negative number, we flipped that inequality, it went from less than to greater than. So anytime you multiply or divide by a negative, you flip the inequality. And that's really the most important thing for you to remember. Solving inequalities is the exact same thing as solving equations. You can add or subtract whatever you want to both sides as long as it's the same. You can multiply or divide anything by both sides as long as it's the same. Of course, there is an exception to the rule. You cannot divide or multiply by zero. Um, that makes it undefined, or you would have zeros less than zero, which doesn't make any sense. So never multiply or divide by zero, but other than that, you're good to go. Add or subtract what you want. Multiply or divide by what you want. Just be careful if you multiply or divide by a negative, you have to flip that inequality. So let's just put these rules to work. Again, these, these properties, you do not need to know the names of these properties. It's just reminding you what tools do you have in your tool chest to solve these problems. So let's look at the first one. It says find a solution set of the inequality negative 2x minus 3 is less than 7. We need to write our answer in interval notation because it is not one single answer. It's not something like x equals 2. There's going to be an infinite number of answers to this. So we're going to write those answers using interval notation. So if this were an equation, we would try to isolate x. We're going to do the exact same thing with an inequality. Start by adding 3 to both sides to get that x term by itself. When I do that, I'm going to have negative 2x is less than 10. Again, I'm still trying to isolate that x value. So I'm going to divide both sides by that coefficient of negative 2. When I divide by a negative, though, I have to be super, super careful. And remember, anytime you divide by a negative, you have to flip that inequality. That's one of the most forgotten things when you do this. And so on the left, I'd have x, and then I'd have greater than, and then this would be negative 5. So now I have my solution using an inequality, but that's not how I want to write my answer. I want to write my answer in interval notation. So what do I do? Think about your number line right here. Here's the number negative 5. Again, we do have x on the left, so the inequality is going to point the direction that we need to shade. It points to the right. I need to shade to the right. This is x is greater than, bigger than, negative 5. And then again, we cannot equal that number, so I'm going to have to use a parentheses. So what's the answer going to be from left to right? We always have to answer from left to right. Our answer is going to be negative parentheses, negative 5, all the way, comma, to infinity, and again, infinity always has to be in a parentheses. 
So solving linear inequalities isn't too difficult, just like solving linear equations. But the second we go up in the power or degree of the equation, we go to quadratics or more. We throw in any fractions in the inequality, uh, solving the inequality. It gets significantly more difficult. So hopefully in your intermediate algebra class and or college algebra class, you covered something called the sign chart method. You probably don't remember the name. You might remember the process. And here's the idea. Now, the general idea is if a function is smooth and continuous, there's no holes, gaps, jumps. When you graph it, it's nice and easy. You can draw it with your pencil. The only way to go from positive numbers to negative numbers is by crossing over that x-axis, crossing when it equals to zero. Okay. The only way to go from negative to positive, same thing. If I want to go from negative y values to positive y values, I'd have to cross that x-axis. As long as my function is nice and smooth and there's no jumps and skips, I'd have to draw it crossing that x-axis. So what's the idea? We're going to start up by setting the inequality, just create it, treat it just like it's an equation, and set it equal to zero. Find those places where it touches the x-axis. And then we're going to look at those intervals and we're going to test one point for each one of those intervals to determine on that interval is my y value positive or is my y value negative. And here's the cool thing. Rather than testing an infinite amount of points, we only need to test one point in each one of those intervals. This is something you're going to see time and time and time again this semester. In fact, you're going to do this no less than 50 times this semester, if not over 100 times this semester. The sign chart is extremely important, so please make sure you understand this process. Again, step one, set the equation equal to zero and solve. It's really an inequality, but treat it like it's an equation. Two, plot the solutions on a number line and determine the intervals to test. Three, test one point in each one of those intervals. And four, interpret the results. What did the original inequality want? Did it want when it was greater than or less than zero? So let's do a nice example right here. A simple quadratic function for you, or quadratic inequality in this case. It says, find the solution set of the inequality. x squared is greater than 3x plus 10. Write your answer using interval notation. So this is going to be a, a more difficult, longer problem, um, but let's, let's take a look at this. So what's the first thing we want to do? Well, let's write down that inequality so we can start our work. x squared is greater than uh, 3x plus 10. So the first thing we want to do is treat it just like it's an equation. Think about the equation x squared is equal to 3x plus 10. What would you do if that were an equation? Well, hopefully you remember how to solve quadratic equations. One of the most easiest ways of solving a quadratic equation is by setting it equal to zero and trying to factor or using the quadratic formula. So what I'm going to do is get everything on one side of the equation. So I'm going to subtract 3x and subtract 10 from both sides of the equation to set this equation equal to zero. When I do that, I'd have x squared minus 3x minus 10 equals zero. Again, you have to be comfortable with factoring. If you are not comfortable with factoring, you are not ready for a calculus course. Minimally, you need to be able to use the quadratic formula on this problem. Quadratic formula, if you remember, is the negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. That will always work to get you your solutions, but time is of the essence when you're doing a calculus problem and you need to be quick at this. So when I'm factoring a quadratic, I need, with a leading coefficient of one, I need two numbers that multiply to be the constant and add to be the middle coefficient. So there was a lot of math language for you. What I'm saying is, is you need two numbers that multiply to be negative 10, and those same two numbers need to add to be three. So let me write that out for you again. I need two numbers that multiply to be negative 10, and those same two numbers need to add to be negative three. You should know how to factor. Let's think about those numbers and the factors of 10. Seems to me like five and two are gonna be the magic ones. I gotta be really careful with my signs. I think a negative five and a positive two would work here. A negative five and a positive two has to be the exact same two numbers, also works there. Now that gives me my factors. So I'd have x minus five times x plus two equals 10. So now that I've factored it, I always wanna take a quick second and foil it out, distribute it. x times x is x squared x times 2 is 2x, 
negative five times x is minus five x, so two x minus five x is the minus three x, and then negative five times two is the negative 10. So if I foiled this out, I did factor this properly. Again, I'm sorry here, it looks like I made a small error on the right. That shouldn't say equals 10, that should say equals zero, equals zero over there, okay? So what do you do? What's the purpose of this? We know if two numbers multiply to be zero by the zero product rule, that means one of those two factors, or both, have to equal zero. So we set each of those factors equal to zero. We solve each of these simple equations. I would have x equals five, and I'd have x equals negative two. So these right here are my x-intercepts. Um, these aren't x-intercepts, x-intercepts are points. I'd have to write them as ordered pairs. So it would be the point five, zero, and the point negative two, zero would be the x-intercepts. These are called the zeros. This is where it crosses the x-axis. So what I wanna do now is I wanna consider that number line, and I wanna plot these two points. Don't worry about scale, don't worry about other points, just this is a rough sketch right here. Here's the number negative two, and here's the number five, okay? So I'm gonna think about my function here, my function being the x squared minus three x minus 10. I'm gonna think about that function. I know at negative two, the value is zero, and at five, it's zero. How do I know that? Because I set it equal to zero and solved, okay? So now I need to consider the other intervals here. The first interval is gonna be all the way to the left, which would be negative infinity, up to the first point, which would be negative two, I'm always going to use parentheses here. The middle interval starts at negative 2, and it goes to 5, always parentheses. The last interval goes from 5 all the way to the right, which would be all the way to infinity. So those are my three intervals that I need to test. I need to test one point in each one of those intervals. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw a little chart. I'm going to take an x value from each one of those intervals, and I'm going to plug it into my calculator and plug it into that original equation, that original equation being this equation where I set it equal to zero. Okay, so that's the equation that I'm plugging it into when I set it equal to zero, x squared minus 3x minus 10. In fact, what's even better to do it into is the factored form. If you can do it into the factored form, let me go up and clean that up. Because those are identical, putting it into the factored form, a lot easier for me. The reason why, let me show you in just one second. So this is x minus five and x plus two. Let's think about the first interval. The first interval is negative infinity to negative two. So I need some number that's less than negative two. I like numbers like tens, ones, and zeros. So those are the numbers I'm gonna to try to stick to. I'll check, pick negative 10. If you notice, negative 10 is in that first interval. Now we need to pick something that's in that second interval. A number in the second interval between negative two and five. Again, I like tens, zeros, ones. Those are easy numbers to plug in, so I'll pick the number zero. Let's look at that third interval. Thinking about a number that's bigger than five in that third interval, any number you want, I'll go ahead and pick the number 10. So when I pick these, I'm plugging it into the function. All I care about is, is it positive or is it negative? That's what I'm looking for. Is it positive or is it negative? So all I care about is the sign, not the value. So think about, let's plug in negative 10 into the factors. All I care about is positive and negative, so let's give this a try. Negative 10, so what would negative 10 minus five be? If I did negative 10 minus five, I believe I would get a negative number. It is negative 15, but I don't care about that. It's, it's a negative number, okay? Let's think about plugging negative 10 into that second factor negative 10 plus two. Negative 10 plus two is negative eight. I don't care about that. All I care is that it's a negative number. And if I think about a negative times a negative, I know that a negative times a negative has to be positive. So since this number right here in the first interval was positive, that means every number, no matter what I pick in that first interval, any number then less than negative two, if I plugged it in, would have to be positive. You don't believe that? Check many, many different numbers. But all you have to do is test one. Let's check the next one, zero. So again, I'm plugging zero into that first um, factor. Zero minus five is a negative number. I plug in zero into that second factor. Zero plus two is a positive number. And then think about a negative times a positive. Any negative number times any positive number has to be negative. So I looked at the second interval. 
I plugged it in and I got a negative number. What's that mean? No matter what number I plug in on that second interval, it is negative. Let's look at that third interval. It's the interval from five to infinity. I just randomly picked the number 10. 10 minus five is positive, plugging it into the first factor. 10 plus two is also positive. A positive times a positive is a positive number. Again, on that third interval, when I plugged it in, I got positive. So that means every single number in that interval, when I plug it in, I get positive. So right now, I have done steps one, two, and three of the sign chart method. I treated it like an equation, set it equal to zero, plotted those points on the number lines, determined my intervals, picked one point from each interval, plugged it in, and determined if it's positive or negative. It's kind of a lot of work, but all of that work sets us up for the final answer. So let's go back to the original problem. The original problem wanted when is this function x squared greater than uh, 3x plus 10, or if I subtracted the 3x and subtracted the, the 10, it would have been when is x squared minus 3x, pardon me, let me get my pen, x squared minus 3x minus 10 greater than zero. The important part that I'm getting at here is that it's a greater than zero problem. Greater than zero means when is it positive. Greater than zero means when is it positive. So it wants when is this function positive. Well, all we have to do is go back and look at our sign chart for anywhere it was positive. And it seems to me the intervals in which it was positive, now we're giving the intervals is the answer. The intervals in which when I plugged it in, I got a positive number, were the intervals negative infinity to negative two. And you might see that U symbol there, that U means union, just means or. I don't require that you put it, but it might require that you put it in your uh, online homework software. So the union five to infinity. Notice I am using parentheses on these ones. Why am I using parentheses? I'm using parentheses because it was strictly greater than, it was not greater than or equal to. If it was greater than or equal to, I would have used brackets. So long problem, summary, what do you do? Set it equal to zero and solve. That gave us the five and negative two. Plot those numbers on the number line and get your intervals. Pick one number in each one of those intervals. Plug it into the equation. The, the factored form is the best form to plug it into if you can. Determine whether it's positive or negative. We do not care about the value. All we care about is whether that value is positive or negative. Once you get all those values, positive or negative, look at the original problem, see what it wanted. This problem wanted greater than zero, so I picked all the points where it was positive. If it said less than zero, the answer would have been negative two to five. Hope that helps.